Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe, and this is the Expat Money Show. Today's guest teaches you how to embrace the art of financial sustainability. His methods will help you generate income autonomously throughout your life, independent of geographical restrictions, so that you can live life to the fullest without relying on third parties or being a work slave to a nine to five job. You'll learn to change your mindset on how you think about life and money through financial sustainability. He is the host of the Unconstrained podcast. Please welcome to the show, Miles Wakeham. Miles, how are you? I'm wonderful, and it's an honor to be on your show. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. You know what? So I was on your show, I think, what, about a year ago, I think we decided for episode 44 and talking about getting out of Dodge. And then it wasn't until really uh, recently that I actually started doing research for new, my guests for my show and actually your name came up and got recommended through a, a site that I use. And I started to learn about your backstory. I was like, oh my God, I get, got to get Miles on my show. I didn't realize all the things that you had done and about your life. So saying that, why don't you kind of take a minute and walk us through your backstory, I guess how you became an expat, but a, a lot about your entrepreneurial or investor journey as well, I suppose. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm originally from Australia. I've come from the city on the South Central Coast called Adelaide. Not a big city. It's got about a million people, but at the same time, it's not really a destination spot for a lot of people. So I grew up in that big version of the small town, I guess. Um, I found by the age of 15 that a whole bunch of things that I was being taught in school didn't actually make any sense to me. And I I guess I had some amazing magic ability to tell my parents, I don't want to stay in school. And they let me loose before I even finished high school to go and start businesses. And uh, I work in the technology industry. I have for over 40 years. Um, having said that, I actually haven't worked for the last 20 of those. Um, what I ended up doing was I, I got on the cusp of the emerging personal computer industry back in 1978. Um, there was no such thing as a computer back then that people could buy on their own. And then when all of a sudden they became available, everyone wanted people who could write software for them. And I happened to be that nerdy kid in my bedroom with a computer and I made a lot of money. Um, I was able to see a, a, a looming or emerging opportunity in something. And I just managed to have the ability to convince my parents to let me pursue it. And it worked out extremely well by about the age of 25, I had a, a very thriving company. We had done work with governments, defense contractors, major corporations. I was a kid. I mean, I didn't know squat, but I knew how to program these computers. What I didn't realize, which sort of became more apparent as I got older, was that there was this innate sense of being able to understand things that I had. It was, I, don't, I think everybody has this. I just think that most people repress it in some way. Often they do it uh, willingly, not realizing it. And I was this guy who could go into something, co not courageously is not the right word, but I could go into something and understand it. And it didn't matter who was in the room. It didn't matter their stature, their age, their, their anything. I would just say, yeah, I put all that aside. Let's get to what is really going on here. Tell me what's going on. And I was really able to do that. And that meant the value of what I was able to produce in terms of computer software was very high. Um, it led me into coming to the United States when I was 25. Um, I had just finished writing software that ran a $5 billion submarine contract in Australia. So, and I did it on a Mac, if you can believe that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I did this thing and some of the guys from, from there, the, the big, you know, big honking um, engineering experts who made missile systems, or whatever, kind of took a liking to me. And one way or another, I ended up under their wing and in Los Angeles. Um, but I couldn't work. Uh, immigration wouldn't let me. So I stumbled around LA. Um, I was a musician as well. So I sort of fell into bands and into the recording industry. But when I eventually got my status where I could work, I ended up interviewing and that was kind of unusual. I bounced into a small little startup in um, Southern California that did some medical thing that I didn't understand, but they needed computer people. Um, they gave me a ton of stock options, which again, I didn't understand what that was, uh, but I just wanted a job. 
And um, next thing you know, five years later, that was the world's largest biotech corporation company called Amgen. And I walked away a millionaire. So <laughs> it was an unusual thing, but you know, I didn't do anything. To, I didn't feel like I deserved anything because I hadn't done anything worthy of that. I mean, I'd, I'd done really good work in what I was doing, but it just came upon me. And that's something for a kid who came from a, you know, a small city, small town, that's a bit of a life changer right there, right? Well, as it, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, you can't make this stuff up. Like, I mean, the story, like, I mean, starting at 25 and then falling into a job that you just don't really know, you don't really understand, you don't really, you know, expect very much of and turn around and it becomes one of the largest companies in the world and you're in at the ground floor and stock options make you a multimillionaire. Yeah. I know, and I, even weirder <laughs> is that when I joined, they had no approval from the FDA for anything. So they'd never, there was a mob of, you know, I was like, I don't know, number 150 guy on the, on the floor, but most of the people were running around with these white lab coats trying to work out what gene splicing was. And I'm like, I don't understand. You need to have some help with computers. I'll help you out. Right. And then by the time I left, they had 4,000 employees and made $4 billion in annual sales. <laughs> I mean, okay, fair enough. I mean, these stories do come true, but they're not real. Um, yeah. And that's something I learned later on. So what, what happened is um, about five years later, I had married. Uh, I ended up getting a phone call from uh, Adelaide from Australia, where I'm from. My mother had a car accident. I need to come to come down there immediately. So, yep, on the next flight over the Pacific again, uh, I ended up <laughs> in the process of transitioning between two countries. I made over 42 flights over the equator, which is really hard. <laughs> but eventually you get to love the silver tube. Um, and anyway, you get, I get down there. I find out she needs, uh, she's lost it. I mean, unfortunately... She had dementia, no one realized it. Um, she couldn't drive a car, she couldn't look after herself. I said to my wife, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to go back. So I went back, sold everything I had in the States, brought all of my wealth back to my hometown, dealt with the fact that I was like Frodo returning to the Shire and nobody can understand me. No one could understand what I did. No one that knew reverse anything. culture shock. That's exactly. a real thing, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, and it hurts too, because you're the guy, the people you left five or six years prior who saw you off at the airport, right? And then you go back and you're sitting down having dinner and those awkward conversations where you're like, yeah, well, I just did this and I just did that. And it's kind of at a different level. And they're saying, yeah, the football this week or, you know. I I'm, can I'm definitely relate to this. Yeah. yeah, For Canada, it's the hockey. It's the Maple Leafs or something. And go. how they did. <laughs> and it's not that you don't love your friends or you don't, you know, but you just, you can't, you're not there anymore. You're not, you, you outgrew the big lake, you're the fish, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that realization hurts. Um, but eventually I thought, you know, I can get through this. Um, I'm here with a mission. I've got to look after my mom or whatever. But in the realization of going back, everything just was destroyed about me. So the first thing happened, unexpectedly, I get divorced. My wife didn't make the transition, I guess, as well as I did, even though I was struggling with it. She had enormous uh, issues, and so she left. And, of course, that took half the wealth in the process, which, you know, that's understandable. I, I'm, not, I'm not bitter about anything like that. Then um, I was kind of in this really dark place, and some friends of mine said, listen, um, it's Christmas time coming up. You can't be sitting around the house all by yourself, depressed. How about you come on a road trip to us? You know, we're going to go up to the beach in Queensland and it'll be great. So we did that. And then I was up there for a couple of days and I was like, oh, yeah, okay, fine. Let's go home. <laughs> that was kind of my mentality. And on the way back, we're driving for about two days and we ended up in a massive car accident and the girls i was in the back seat of the car the girl in the front of me was killed my buddy was driving he got away okay but i was left basically with half of my body destroyed uh from a major high-speed car wreck and i'm sort of very lucky to survive i was in a coma for about seven days um i came out of that 
airlifted back to the hospital, you know, hospital in my hometown, and then spent the next six weeks trying to build myself back to partially human again, only to find out that, uh, you know, six months later or so after they sort of kicked me out of the public medical system in Australia, which is not very good, to be honest. But anyway, um, they kicked me out. And all of a sudden, the state insurance company, which was a mandated thing on these cars, wouldn't pay the bill. And I'm like, what? I need ongoing treatment here. I'm like, disabled at this point and they're like nah the problem is the guy who was driving drove too fast the parents of the girl who was killed are, uh, you know completely distraught and they're suing him for criminal negligent homicide and the second wow. that it's a criminal case we ain't paying squat i'm like thanks so i wasn't allowed to even testify at his trial they wouldn't let me anywhere near the thing um, eventually they dropped the case because they realized it didn't have any merit. And by then I was so far gone, you know, that I had just been, I just accepted this was my lot. This was where it stops. You know, the guy who was once the, the hero in California is now the cripple, you know, back in his hometown. But after um, I ended up getting remarried, we ended up having a daughter. And a couple of years later, I said, you know, to hell with this. I've got control over who I am, right? And I know that the, the, the grass is way greener on the other side of the equator. I'm getting out of here. So I managed to get, a buddy of mine calls me from LA and says, do you want a six week consulting gig? I'm like, sure. So I got in a plane, went there. Um, and then I got there and it was the dot-com boom, right? Everything was, no, a computer guy and that can make money any day. I mean, it's easy. So I started doing it. I'm like, I called my wife up and I said, get, get your butt in the plane. You and the daughter, we're going on, we're coming over here. This is where the action is. So, so she did. And we came over and we recreated a life again. And again, in Southern California. And within, I don't think it's 12 months, I was back on my feet, making good money. And then the dot-com crash happened. But at this time, <laughs> round two, right? This time, I'm like, you know what? I can get through anything. I'm not going to let this stuff stop me. I've just been almost killed in a car accident, been divorced, lost all of my money trying to sort that out. I came back here with nothing, just a suitcase and, a, and some hope and ideals. Screw this. I'm going to make this happen. So I got really, really co uh, committed. We sold our home that we had built, uh, bought in Southern California, got a big U-Haul, hauled us to Arizona, bought a place here, which was cheaper. And I began to rebuild a business, which was mainly real estate. And within five, six years, I was a millionaire again. It was amazing. Then- um, Mario, there's so much to unpack here. There's so yeah. many things here to unpack. This is like an up and down, up and down, up and down. But I mean, uh, I, I guess, I'm gonna guess that because you, made millions once you knew that you could do it a second time a third time you could do it over and over again i think that a lot of people in their brain there's some type of a sticking point where they just don't think that it's possible for them they think maybe it's only movies or hollywood stars or you know in books and tv and stuff like that that people can do these types of things or other people are special but i'm not special so they put these types of restraints on themselves and you had already done it once. So mm -hmm. to do it a second time wasn't a, a sticking block for you or a mental block. That's what I would assume. Am I right or am I wrong on this? No, you're, you're right. But I never took credit for getting it the first time. Okay. That was given to me. It had mm -hmm. nothing to do with anything I did. The second time it did that. Yeah. The second time I took the tenacity and the stubbornness of not let, not, not accepting your lot and then just saying, well, that's how life is and suck it up. I, I don't do that. I'm, you know, it just doesn't work for me that way. And I think that that combined with having an awareness of that these things are possible gave me the mindset and the tools to do it. And we did, but it gets weirder. <laughs> so <laughs> I built up real estate and I did it through leverage and debt and all of these things, but we did it in multiple countries. 
I had properties in Australia because still as an Australian citizen, I was eligible to buy property and get mortgages down there. So I did that at the time when their resource boom was going up because the Chinese were buying WA. Yeah. And in, in, in the States, I realized that I could leverage that and start the process off in, in uh, Arizona, which I did as well. And everything was just plain sailing perfect until 2008 happened. And then lo and behold, you know, we're all left with the, no chair and the music stopped. Um, no money, properties are worth, I don't know, 40% of what they used to be. And all of a sudden I thought, here we go, hero to zero again. And literally I, my net worth went from millions to nothing. And I thought, oh, here we, this is great. You know, easy come, easy go, I guess. But again, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit there and take it. You know, I have faith that the real estate will serve me. I'm not going to serve it. And I'm certainly not going to give my life up to some bankster. So at the end of the day, they created this mess. I didn't. People still need a roof over their head. I'm loyal to that principle. So I will make, I will get through this. So what I did was I played a bit of arbitrage. And this is where being an expat pays off. In Australia, the property that I had bought a number of years back had tripled in price because of the Chinese boom. In the States, property had, dumped, had halved in price. Okay, sell the property in Australia, take the winnings, bring it over, pay off the mortgages. I still had a ton of cash and then find everybody else in the States who had lost their homes to foreclosures or you, know, you can pick them up at auctions for pennies on the dollar. So I did. And I went and bought streets of property. I was like Monopoly guy. I'm just buying <laughs> that one, that one, that one, that one. And I did because I knew people need a roof over their head, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. By, by, by 2013, after every, the dust had settled and all of our properties had rental tenants in there and they were doing well, I had five times the money I had had prior to going to the crash. And this thing's going up gangbusters because every time the property market went up, I had 20 properties going up at the same time. And that was when I realized, okay, Miles, now you earned it. Mm -hmm. So I got that. Now, me meanwhile, this is weird. Being a tech guy, I had given up doing a lot of work in technology. I was doing a little bit of contract work here and there, but um, I, uh, a guy that, you know, my old, alma mater, if you like, back in Australia, a guy, funny guy by the name of Julian Assange, who happened to be in a computer club in another state where we were, but I was in a similar club. We often, you know, went between and, and whatever. He started to get a little famous for what he was doing, uh, sort of opening up and uncovering all of the truths of, you know, what his group had found. And I looked at it and I'm going, yeah. I, I get it. I see what the big evil has done out there. I saw what it did in the banking sector. I could see what it was doing with, you know, post 9-11. And yeah, I, I, I get this, buddy. I mean, I, I, I appreciate what you're doing. I need to give you some money, right? I'm going to help you run your servers. So I try to send money. And of course, everyone shut him down. PayPal, Bank of America, uh, Western Union, everybody. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is ridiculous. And he says uh, in his blogs and whatever, you can pay me with this thing called Bitcoin. Okay. What, what year is this? Now? What year is this? I'm going to say it's 2011. Oh, I can just see where this is going. Okay. Sorry. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny because I had a guy work. And again, this is an expat mindset. Um, I see people, regardless of where they live in the world, based on who they are and what they do and their skills and what they bring to the table, right? That's what I would want to be judged on. I don't want to be judged because of my skin color or where I'm from or my silly accent or whatever. I want to be judged on what I can do. Oh, and there's 8.1 billion people out there who feel the same way, by the way. And so I was finding programmers who I could use via the internet who are in crazy countries um, Vietnam, Indonesia, Bangladesh, uh, all these places where their economy was destroyed and they didn't need much money to live a decent life. 
And I buddied up with a guy who was in Bangladesh, who was a genius programmer. He was helping me work on some project. I had to pay him. And it just so happens after I'm reading about this Bitcoin thing, he's telling me, yeah, the government here is, you know, taking all my money and all this stuff. I said, why don't we try Bitcoin? And so we said, okay, so let's go and get some of this Bitcoin. So the only place back in those days was this exchange in Japan called NT Gox. So it was costing me, a, I don't know, $75 or something to wire money outside of the country at the time. So I just decided, let's just go and buy a large amount of this stuff with this MT Gox. So I wired money to them and I just bought tons of Bitcoin. And I'm having it like a, like a bank account so I can pay him for his work. And I gave Julian some money and, I, you know, it's like, Back in those days, you'd meet somebody in a party and they'd go, give us your phone. I'm going to give you a Bitcoin, right? That's, <laughs> that's how it was because they were worthless. I mean, well, well, not worthless, but, you know, three bucks. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. I, when I bought it, it was like seven. So anyway, I've got all this stuff. Meanwhile, um, talk about dodge a bullet. My guy in Bangladesh tells me, um, yeah, there's this ATM machine at the local like 7-Eleven and apparently, if I, you know, I can use a debit card to get cash out because I need the, the local currency there, but I can't, I can't spend the Bitcoin you're sending me for all the work I'm doing. So I said, okay, well, there's, I found this exchange in Hong Kong that would give you a debit card, like a Visa debit card type thing against your Bitcoin holdings. So I shifted all the money over to them. A week later, Mt. Gox got hacked and went down. Yeah, and they still haven't recovered the money from that. I still don't know what the hell happened there. Yeah, yeah. But wow. by now, I'm, I'm cool, right? I got, out, I, I, I got off this ship before it sank. I didn't realize, but I realize now, you know, how, how uh, sensitive this can be. But anyway, I, I was in Hong Kong. He's getting paid. Everything's good. Left the money there. Didn't really care much about it. And then I start seeing the value of Bitcoin as it's going up and up and up and up. And I think it went to like 12, 1200 before it dumped to, to nothing. And then I thought, you know what? I see this for what it's doing. It's allowing me to pay people anywhere in the world without a problem. So I bought more. <laughs> I just kept buying more. And at that time, it was like about 150 bucks each. But I didn't care. I'm like, I'll buy more. Um, this, I also was an avid watcher of uh, Max Kaiser. I don't know if you know Max, he's, a, uh, he's uh, on the RT. Fucking head, yeah. Yeah. Um, he was a real railing against the banks. Now, you know, the banks almost put me out of business in 2008. I don't like banks. <laughs> so all of a sudden I'm like, Max doesn't like banks and he's talking about this Bitcoin thing like it's the future. And I'm like, my experience would say, yeah, that sounds pretty much right on the money, Max. So I ended up just getting involved in the whole Bitcoin thing. And then fast forward to about 2018 um, is when I sort of lost my faith in that. And I didn't lose my faith in Bitcoin. I lost my faith in humans. I started seeing greed. I saw all the flaws of humanity, the FOMO, the, the scams. I saw people who never should have been involved in this business, um, giving it just a bad rep. And at that point, I'd made so much money on it. I just said, I'm out. So I cashed my chips and went and bought more real estate <laughs> and said to my wife, um, you know, there's one thing about the real estate, which I really like, and it seems to be the polar opposite way that all of my friends here in America were thinking. They were thinking you buy low and you sell high, right? And I was looking at going, well, that, that's okay for an, as a transactional approach to, to life. But the problem is when you sell anything, you don't have it anymore. And the problem is that every day that we exist, every, every day that we, every month that goes by, I got to pay the rent, the mortgage, the insurance payments, put food on the table, the phones, all this stuff. There's a burn rate. What if you can make that burn rate by the things that you own paying you to own them as opposed to buying and selling all the time and killing the goose that's laying the golden egg? We've got all these rental properties. They're generating us all this rent. We paid them off because we played creative financing because we hate banks. 
And then I took some, you know, paid off any debts that we had with all the Bitcoin winnings. And now I can live on the rents for the rest of my life. Aha! <laughs> There's your, forget the price of something. That's only important if you sell it. What if you never needed to sell anything and you're just living on the dividends? And then when I came to that realization, I said, oh, there's legs to this. And then I went through this process of ana analyzing, you know, back to my analysis brain, and I codified it into a system that made very, very simple sense. But I realized what I was actually doing was I was, I was sh putting shade on social mantra. Everything that probably you and I were taught when we were kids, finish school, work hard, get a good job, you know, put your money in some interest bearing account, 65, you can retire, live in the Bahamas. I call bullshit on that very easily because I just finished raising, well finished, I never finished, but I've, I'm raised a daughter. I put her through college. I watched her go through that. And I watched that, that vision be destroyed by reality that the banks with the student loan debt for the kids going into college are just stealing money from them, just like they tried in 2008. And just like we tried to fight them in, with, with all this crypto and alternative currencies, these kids don't have a chance. And as a, as a father, that's on me. I can't let that happen. And so when she finished college and then she couldn't find a job like everybody else, she came to me and said, dad, what do you think I do? I should do. And I said, well, what's your mission? Like, what are you trying to achieve? What makes you happy? What's your passion? And then I realized none of those kids had an answer to that question. And I said, well, you know what? The only way you're going to find it is you've got to go out there and travel. You've got to go out there and put yourself in a difficult situation where you don't speak the language, where you're forced to adapt and you will find yourself. It's what I had to do. And it's kind of like a, 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 a a route of passage, it's a, it's a barrier that you must overcome because once you overcome that and you understand who you are, everything starts to make sense. Just like I had learned in my life, sometimes things come easy. That doesn't mean you learn shit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> the only time you learn it is when it's taken from you and you've got to fight and you've got to learn that it's in you. It's not in anybody else. And if you take that innate sense and skill that you build up by exposing yourself to adverse events and learning who you are when you come out of it, you are forever stronger. And my own story, which hasn't finished, of course, but my own story shows that you can have it all, but it ain't going to be yours if it gets given to you for free. And I know you and I probably read similar internet feeds and Twitter feeds and whatever. And we hear about the kids out there with the Wall Street bets and we, you know, and the, I made money on this shit coin or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is you haven't made anything until it's been taken from you. And then you pull in the side of you, the skills out that enables you to actually emerge and to be stronger and realize okay, now it's real. Now I have to do it. Yeah, right? I think absolutely. Every time that you put yourself into difficult situations, chance, situations that really challenge you, that push you right up to the wall, and you have to overcome those, it builds character. And I think that what's happening so much today, there's not enough character. There's not enough people that go through difficult things. They just expect things to be handed to them. And like, I'm not trying to harp on any particular generation, but just as a whole, I think hard things are good for people. I mean, overcoming adversity builds skills and self-reliance and responsibility. And my goodness, you certainly have those qualities, Miles. Absolutely. And looking back at your story, I think it's very interesting also that you left school at a very young age, same as I did. And you asked a question, a, a hypothetical question at the beginning of the episode, which was, you know, why is it like this? Why do people like, why was I not the same as everybody else? And I would say that is probably one of the deciding factors 
It certainly is for me. I know that I was not in the public education system for as long as my peers, which really set me apart from everybody else because I didn't have that type of programming that everyone else did. But not having that programming was actually a massive advantage for me. And it sounds like it was for you as well. Yeah. Um, one thing I've noticed that's kind of consistent um, since I started telling this story, I started explaining my methodology, which I created this concept of financial sustainability, where you can generate enough money that covers your burn rate and then give you the freedom to travel the world and do everything you want without worrying about money anymore. Um, all of that started to show up a really underlying flaw that I think our educational systems in the Western world is just completely lost. And that is this concept of why. And why do I want to be a doctor? Why do I want to be an accountant? Why do I want to be a, 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 an engineer? Is it because that's what my calling is? Or is it I'm picking the best of a worst breed of options here? Does the high school guidance counselor actually have standing to guide me? No, right? The hardest part here is that people don't want to face themselves. I mean, if you think about everything in the world, which is difficult, it's, it's okay that you, you know, maybe you've got to travel to Hong Kong or something and you've got jet lag. Okay, big deal. Maybe you had to buy an airline ticket. Those things are easy, mm -hmm. right? What's difficult is when you look at yourself in the mirror and you realize at two in the morning when you can't sleep that I don't have an answer to the why. Why am I doing what I do? What am I doing? What, is, what makes me happy? What makes me passionate? The people who have got the answer to that, that everything falls into place for them. But most of our society are never challenged to go out there and find any form of evidence as to who they are. And for me, that evidence came from travel. It came from exposing myself in difficult situations where the only person who could get out of it was me. Mm -hmm. and, and in that, you discover yourself. And I think this is, a, this is an age-old problem that dates back you know, forever. I mean, you look at you know, Buddhist monks or something in Nepal who spend a lifetime in contemplation of removing the eye from their situation to decide where they exist in, in relation to the, the ultimate world. But we don't do that. We don't challenge ourselves enough to understand that. And so what, what happens is a kind of a side effect. You're sitting at the kitchen table with your parents and they shove a, a student loan debt contract in front of an 18 year old, which in most states in the United States, that guy isn't even eligible to buy a beer at a bar yet. Mm -hmm. He's expected to sign his name to a $100,000 plus mortgage, right? But he doesn't know, or she doesn't know his why or her why, because they've not gone out there to find it. And the parents, they don't sit there and go, kid, you need to get out of the house and go and backpack for a couple of years or whatever it takes, right? They don't, they don't know that. What they say is, well, I went to college, so you should go to college. And it's all about which college, not about whether. It's about which. You've got to go to Or Yale. you get the families out there who the parents did not go to college, and it was their dream to send their kid to college, thinking yeah. that that was going to be the solution for everything. That's so true, but it's not. And yeah. the kid ends up leaving at the end, going into some crappy job, working in a cubicle, hating the boss, hating the commute, looking out the window for 98% of the day, wondering why am I here and why is it that I hate my job and why, and is this going to be my lot until I'm 65? Because now I've got a mortgage and a family and kids and you know, obligations and I can't get off. And I look at it and go, no wonder uh, the entire generation of 20 somethings these days don't want that. Mm -hmm. And my God, I wouldn't want it either. How about we support them? How about we let give them a path by showing them alternatives? How about we break the social mantra? We break what their government's telling them because they just want to extract tax revenue. And we break the bankster back issue, which is based on the concept of a mortgage, which is in French translation equates to death contract, right? Mm -hmm. 
if all of a sudden we realize these guys have got not got our best interests, the only people who we can rely on is us. And if we haven't had any chance to understand who we are, how do we rely on that? You know, the, 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 um, the spin-off of this, which is that people go and do the job they hate nine to five. And, you know, we've got a high divorce rates that come out of that due to often money problems, but often just lack of purpose. That's one. But the biggest one, which I note, is how people spend money to try to fill the void. Retail therapy, or they buy a boat they don't need, or a car they don't they can't afford, or a house that's bigger because they want to look bigger in the neighborhood. But meanwhile, they know deep down they're not that big, right? They don't know the why. So they never pursue that. They fill it with stuff. They fill it with consumption, which further <laughs> expands the credit card bill and further entraps them into the job they can't escape, right? When I start talking about this sort of thing, and I'm not even talking about whether uh, you know, a dollar's worth the money it used to be or whether you know, the government's got your back or whatever. No one's got your back. You've got your back. And I just, you know, and then so many people will, will skew to, say, political ideologies, which would be I'm a red or a blue or I'm a you know, progressive or I'm a conservative or whatever. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're you. <laughs> work the you part out and let them fit into your story we we are willing actors on somebody else's screenplay and we need to stop that and start writing our own once again so much to unpack so much to unpack in this Jeez, miles um Okay, my goodness, where do I start? First of all, okay, yes, I agree with you. I think that you have really hit the nail on the head with so many things that you've just said. Um, I think that, okay, let's, let's tackle the consumer issue first, I suppose, because that was kind of one of the, the later things you brought up, but, a, but an important one. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with you on this. I mean, I have spent my entire life not on consuming products and buying stuff to fit in a giant house. Actually, I've spent my entire life earning money and then spending it on experiences, experiences with my family, with my wife, with my kids, solo travel with my best friends, going on not just vacations, but out there seeing the world, uh, museums, safaris, historical ruins, going out for nice dinners. I mean, I am a big foodie. I've always been a really big foodie. I love all the history and the culture and the heritage that comes with food and understanding um, not just how did the chef make it, but why did he make it? What is the, where does the history of the recipe come from? The, the, how did their grandmother or their great grandmother or their great, great grandmother make a certain type of dish and why is it regional and seasonal and things like this? I've spent massive amount of money on going out for nice dinners and trying to understand these types of things. And for me, this has been very fulfilling. I've had to do the majority of this stuff with, I mean, a suitcase, a backpack. I mean, not huge amounts of things. Even if I did have a home in another country, I usually either rented my furniture or rented an apartment that was already pre-furnished, or I would buy uh, a couch or a bed secondhand and I would sell it for the exact amount of price when I moved to another country. I've found spending money on experiences and trying to understand the world to be way more rewarding than just trying to get a new car or the biggest big screen TV or the nicest branded clothes or, you know, LV handbags for my wife, which she does have some, but I've tried to put a stop to as much as possible. You know, like, um, so I'm really agree with you on not making consumerism the driving force for your life. Because in my opinion, it is very surface level. It is very shallow. And although you might get an initial high from purchasing something, it doesn't have the depth. It doesn't have something that is going to fulfill you for a very long time. And actually, let's even take a LV handbag. Uh, my wife, you know, she might buy something like that and enjoy it. And she might enjoy it for a few weeks. And then 
the next, you know, turn around the next month and you see it sitting on the ground or, I mean, it's just hanging off the back of the chair, just like any other handbag. She could have bought a $50 handbag instead of a $5,000 handbag. After a couple of weeks, it doesn't really matter anymore. And I think it's the same way with, you know, men and watches or any type of these luxury premium goods. I think that if you can have something that's functional, looks okay, that's probably going to do the trick. You don't need, it's not the more money you spend on it, the more rewarded that you're going to be, if that makes sense. It does. Um, if you look at different cultures, uh, you will find well, one of the cultures that we are uh, very um, sensitive to and, and, and have connected with is the Mexican culture. And uh, partially because I, I actually went to Mexico in 2019 and had major surgery to correct all of the problems from my car accident 20 odd years prior. Mm -hmm. And it cost me pennies on the dollar. But medical I was tourism is an amazing yeah. idea. And the arbitrage that goes with that is something that more people should understand. Yeah, I paid like $9,000 for surgery that in the States was quoted me at over 150,000. So, and you know what? Um, I'm from another country, so I'm an immigrant in the state. So everybody doing it is kind of an, you know, not a native to me. Mm -hmm. My own country let me down. They wouldn't let me have it. So I ended up going to Mexico and I got the best experience of my life. Mm -hmm. But it was more than that. While I was down there um, over a large period of time, convalescing, but also just getting to know the culture and doing the things you're talking about, you know, going out to nice restaurants because you can afford it and, enjoying that whole thing, I started to see a culture that was family oriented. I saw a culture that was about friends and that Absolutely. everyone was welcome and everyone cared about each other, despite what the press might sell it as, which is totally, totally BS. Everybody down there cares about each other, whether it's the guy, the Uber guy driving you around Guadalajara or whether it's the, the guy with the Airbnb host or whether it's the the, the waiter at the restaurant, they actually do care about you. And that having spent decades where everybody was letting me down all the time and it had to rely on me, it was like, serious? <laughs> Can I trust this? Are you really, you, okay, doc, I mean, I'm going to be on the table. You're going to knock me out. You're going to try and put me back together again. I'm going to put my hands at my life in your hands. Do I trust you? Yeah, they did. They took care of me to perfection best experience I've ever had. And when I started to understand that, I wanted to sort of unpack that, or like, uh, you know, peel off the layers of the onion, so to speak. What is in this culture? And I discovered no debt. There's no such thing as a mortgage down there, not, not in a meaningful sense. <laughs> Families have property that are passed down from family to family, or you pay pesos, you pay cash for everything. There's a shadow economy because they don't trust their government and rightly so. And at the end of the day, everybody is happy. And what's the consistent thing here? They don't have a lot of stuff filling a void because in some manner they found purpose collectively, particularly in La Familia, in the family. Um, and that started to connect dots for me. I started realizing there is something to this. And as a result now, my wife and I spend, well, we just came back from a couple of weeks in Mexico last week. Um, we're looking to basically spend half of our life down there uh, because we still need to be close to the North, North American region because our daughter's still here. But at the same time, I don't know if my faith in a culture which has been effectively swindled by this social mantra of you know go to school work hard get a good job save and maybe you can retire that i can't accept that at this point in my life anymore that i came here and i took advantage of the opportunities that were presented and i'm very grateful for that and they've served me very well and i feel like i've served back society here i've pr provided roofs over people's heads and kept the the harsh summer arizona heat off them with good air conditioners and and they've got their responsibility in that deal too, which is their part of a lease contract. But having done that, it's like, what's next? And what's next doesn't appear to be more of the same. I don't want to keep spinning off into technology land and doing something new and every, when it doesn't have the meaning it should have. 
Um, and I look to other countries as you have, and I look to their culture and I look to the experiences that you're talking about. And I realize what I'm seeking with those experiences is I'm seeking further validation in the evidence of me that I've discovered that I will only find climbing Machu Picchu or I'm only gonna find um, in the pyramids of Mexico City or something like that, where I go back and I see history and I see how they got through their adversity and I look at that and I help it validate my own purpose and my own journey. And that's what an expat gets. And if that's priceless, man, that's priceless. We live in a world where you can get on a plane and go anywhere you want easily, very, very low friction. You've got credit cards that'll pay your way when you get there. You've got Airbnb, you've got Ubers that'll drive you around. If this is not a reason that people need to go out there and find themselves. It is so easy, the on-ramp. It's much easier than when probably you and I started traveling. Definitely. Right? Oh my goodness. What's the excuse? You wanna sit there and just perpetuate this cultural mantra that you want, we all know is wrong. We all know is a setup. It's about the banks and their death contracts. Is that what you wanna do? Or do you want to go out to this beautiful planet and you want to meet the 8.1 billion people and eat their food and meet their families and let them actually care about you? Is that what you want to give up? Because you got that stupid job in American Express customer service and your boss is going to fire you if you don't rock up at nine o'clock on the dot every day. Is that life? It ain't for me. It ain't for me. And you've got to question it and it takes courage but it's more of a look in the mirror at yourself. It's not a look. And I don't look back in anger, right? That, that's pointless. I get no, no value for that. But I do look at my own responsibility to my own one life and I don't want to screw it up. Oh, and absolutely. Sucks. As far as any of us know, we have one life to live. One life. I mean, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about anything else here. But as far as we know, we have one life. So it's like, go out there and live it. And as for your point about um, family and community and things in Latin America, I will wholeheartedly agree with you on that. We moved to Panama over two years ago now. And the difference is stark. It is just unbelievable, the mindset shift that people have. There is no keeping up with the Joneses whatsoever there. I just have not seen it. There's so much family. When there's a birthday party for someone's kid, their kid might be six years old or seven years old. They invite the whole family. The entire family comes. Grandma comes. Grandpa comes. Of the friends, not just of the, of the kid, but of the friends, they come. Everybody gets together. There's so much food and music and the piñata and like you go to the park on any random day of the week and there's people sitting out there, they're doing picnics, they have music going. There's just always something family and community. And you're actually included as an expat, which is really nice. I mean, I've been in lots of countries and cultures in the world where there is definitely a barrier. Like I lived in the Middle East for eight years. There is a really strict barrier between the local Emiratis and the expats. They have entire communities, which are only for Emiratis. And getting into that community is really hard. We did have some Emirati friends, but they were pretty um, different Emiratis than the majority. I mean, getting into that was really hard. And then you move to Latin America, and it's like on day one, everything is changed. And as for your other point about how easy things are now, I mean, as I said, I live in Panama. But four months ago, we got on, an, got on a plane, flew down to Brazil because we decided that we wanted to give birth in Brazil. We were pregnant with our second child. And two weeks ago or a few weeks ago, we had our second child here in Brazil. And the people at the hospital were amazing. Everybody was so kind to us, so nice to us. And yes, we have an Airbnb that we rent for four months. We took an Uber to go to the hospital with my wife having contractions and like we ordered it on our phone and the Uber was here about two and a half minutes later. Um, and then coming back, the exact same thing. When I started traveling as an expat in the year 2000, I mean, we didn't have any of this type of stuff. 
Although, yes, we had the internet, but it certainly wasn't like it is today. We didn't have smartphones. We no Ubers, no Airbnbs. I mean, if I had to go through the same experience 20 years ago, that would have been a real ordeal. This was super, super easy. And as you said, to go for medical tourism and to go down to Mexico was not a big leap in your mind because you were already an expat in the United States. So this isn't, you know, your neighborhood community or neighborhood hospital where you grew up. So what's the big difference? It's the same thing for us, whether we gave birth in Panama or we gave birth in Brazil. I mean, it was not a big leap for us. I but think people do put limits on themselves in their mind, right? Because they, uh, for my American friends um, who are, maybe they've got health insurance through their job, which further shackled them to their job. Or maybe they get some government health insurance or something like that. But there's all these, you know, limits like no pre-existing or no this or mm -hmm. you can't have that or you can't guarantee the insurance company is ever going to actually pay the bill and you're going to get stuck with it greatest form of bankruptcy in the united states is medical bankruptcy um, if you're in that situation what most people are doing here which is really hard to understand is um when it came to medical i kind of grouped it into three categories so preventative stuff the stuff like eat good food go to the gym vitamins, you know, that sort of thing. Um, the uh, second might be elective where you've got a bad hip or a bad knee or a bad this, and you need to get it done. And then, uh, but you, you're in control of the schedule. And then the final is adverse where an emergency happens and they call the ambulance and it's unexpected and you're in, you're in hospital. What happens in the States is that the entire medical system is designed for the latter category, the adverse. And everything prior to that is a kind of either we don't take care of ourselves. We, you know, we put on more weight than we should. We don't, we live in a sedentary desk job or we don't walk much or whatever. Um, and then when it comes to elective, there's this void because most people, my friends here are, who are walking around with that bad back or that, you know, whatever, they're going, oh, I can't afford it or I can't get time off. <laughs> or I can't do this. It's like excuse after excuse after excuse. And I'm like, you know, you got one life, right? You know that that physical hardware that is your biology, your body, isn't going to repair itself. You need to intervene, but you're too scared to because you don't know whether or not you're going to walk away penniless. Well, there's no excuse for that when right down on your border that everybody down there, the private healthcare system in Mexico is the is phenomenal, as I'm sure it is in most Latin American countries. Um, and, and yet this barrier, right? This, this fictional barrier. So what happens is they don't get anything fixed. And you look at, this is a scary statistic and it almost sounds conspiratorial until you realize it's factual. The CDC recently published life expectancy of the US male the average US male in the, life in, in the United States. And I was looking at it from the point of view of a money uh, analysis, like how, how much money do you have to save to retire? Like, Because what's the average life expectancy? That was my thought. Well, when I started looking at these things, it was about 2016. At the time, I think the US male life expectancy on average was 79.3 years. Now that's less than most Western countries, certainly less than Western Europe, less than Canada, and even less than Australia, where they have a public health system as a fallback, as a sort of system of last resort almost. Um, but that doesn't come with its own catches. Um, but, but interestingly, the US fallback system is pretty weak. It doesn't really have that support. Well, as I kind of was updating my numbers, I picked up a recent... Um, press announcement from the CDC earlier this year, which were based on 2020 numbers. And yeah, look, I know COVID, right? That's, but it, it, that actually doesn't, isn't a major factor in this. The US male life expectancy dropped to 75.3 years. From 2016 to 2020, four years, we went from 79.3 to 75.3. One year per one year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all right, let's play the numbers on COVID. What was 2019? Pre-COVID, right? It was 76.5 years. The pattern 
of life expectancy is decreasing in the United States at a rate we have never seen before historically, never. And this stuff never gets on the national news, right? All they wanna do is talk about politics and COVID. But the truth is we're all fricking dying here. And until we get real with these numbers and we start realizing that we need to get, we need to find out what is the secret to increasing life expectancy because it sure ain't doing what we're doing right now. So I, I try to bring a message here of wake up. The mantra doesn't work. If you're thinking I'm going to get social security at the age of 67, well, good luck, buddy. You've got eight years to spend it based on these stats. And if you're thinking that you're going to delay all of those experiences and put them on a quote bucket list, you ain't ever going to get to be able to do it. And certainly when you do and you've got a bad back and a bad hip, good luck trying to enjoy that. No, we have to change the way we think about these things. And we don't need to fall into this bankster constructed system that is designed to extract money from you until the day you die, because that day seems to be coming nearer and nearer every time. Well, add to that, I mean, when you're talking about how much time you're going to have left to do the things that you want to do. I started traveling internationally when I was 17. Now I'm 38. So I've been at this for 21 years and I feel like I've barely scratched the surface. So 21 years in my prime, having a ton of energy and tons of patience and out there every single day doing stuff that I wanted to do. And it's like a drop in a bucket. I mean, there's so many places to explore. There's so many things to experience, so many people to meet and, and things to understand. If you think you're going to be able to do that bucket list in that eight years, wow, you just don't realize how big the bucket is. Because when you start doing things, you actually get more dreams, more aspirations. The more you learn about the world, the more you want to learn about the world. It actually goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So you might as well start as early as possible. And then, as you said, try to live it in a healthy, sustainable lifestyle so that you can do it for much longer than everybody else. And yes, you're going to need to take a portion of your income and your energy and your resources and reinvest it in yourself. I mean, that's certainly what me and my wife are doing. We're now really looking at how do we live to be 120, 140, 150 years old with the advances in technology. I actually go out there and spend money on special consultants and do special programs to increase my longevity at 38 years old. This is something that I'm, it's really at the forefront of my life. Now, maybe that has a part to do with the fact that I've just had a second child and I want to make sure that, you know, I can be young and, and flexible and run around with him when, you know, he's a couple of years older and play sports and do all these types of things with him. But I mean, it doesn't really matter what age you're at. This is kind of the wake up call that actually you do need to do these things and start being purposeful with, with your life and your goals and your health. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to this. Well, here's the thing. Did you, do you feel like you're having a midlife crisis right now? Because statistically, you're at the middle of your life based on US CDC numbers. I'm, all right, I'll tell you what's going on with me. I, at the very first time in my entire life, feel like an adult. It's just happened in the last two weeks. I feel like, holy crap, I'm an adult. I'm not a child anymore. Now, I have a five-year-old little girl who, you know, is everything to me and I love and I take care of her. And I was a, I was a parent before my second child. I know how silly that sounds, but I mean, the realization that, you know, I was already a parent. I already had businesses and uh, was married and traveled and did all these types of things. But I still thought of myself as a kid. I look in the mirror. I just think, ah, I'm just some kid who's just figuring this stuff out. And then I had my second child. And I was like, holy crap, I'm not a child anymore. I mean, this shit is serious. I'm an adult now at 38 years old. And like you said, that's midlife. But I just feel like the same difference of, you know, becoming from a teenager to a 20-year-old, I just feel like 
that as I'm approaching 40. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's what's going on with me. It makes sense. I, I, I bring the question up because so many people who will listen to you or watch the show who are of similar age don't realize that they're at the midpoint in their life. They think yeah. that they're still just getting started. And to be honest, they should be still just getting started. They should live post 100. And, you know, that's fine. But they only are going to achieve that end result if they're willing to be outliers to the statistic. Because just as many people, if, they're, if the you, CDC is saying 75 years is a life expectancy, that means that half of the, of the, of the average statistic died before that mm -hmm. and half die after. Well, it's a question of whether or not you want to break that mold and, and doing the same thing over and over again, as Einstein would put it, is insanity if you expect to get different results. Yeah, or so doing I, the same as everybody else who's out there, then you're going to get the results as everybody else out there. Yeah, the, the answer that I found was to take the, uh, don't let the concept of making money define you in that it's an important part, don't get me wrong, but it's part of almost like a trilogy of things. You need your health, you need your purpose and you need your finances. And if you can put those three things together in some harmonious way, then you're fine. But if the finances are stopping you from traveling and they're stopping you from having that life, living that life, then the most important mission that you can have in the short term is to find a way for the money to be able to generate itself. And the one thing that was really a key thing to me was realizing that every time I bought something, I, I put through the rule that says, this better pay me to own it, right? If I buy a piece of real estate, it'll pay me to own it because I generate rents. If I buy a dividend stock, it'll pay me to own it because it pays a dividend. But if it doesn't pay me to own it, I don't care whether I'm buying low, selling high. I don't care about that. That's gambling. <laughs> what I want is buy stuff that pays me to own it. And if I buy enough stuff, over time, which you can do organically, you can leverage, then all of a sudden it's paying me more than I can ever imagine to own it. And now I'm free and I get my time back. So I don't have to be the guy with hundreds of millions of dollars. It's what you deploy the small amount of capital to be able to pay you to own something. So, you know, a lot of people who follow my podcast are often active in the, in the FIRE community, the financial independent retire early community. And I think that they've got good intent because they're trying to get their life back early. They're trying to retire. But I don't think things that way. I don't use the, the R word. I don't use retire mm -hmm. because I do things that never, I never want to stop doing. So I'm not, I'm not working. So I've got nothing to escape from, right? So that's problem number one. But problem number two is, there's this ongoing mental idea that we sit upon this boom market we've had for the last, you know, 11, 12 years now, and that it'll always be like that. And it won't, because as you and I know, things that go up must come down. It's a universal mm -hmm. truth. And if you don't accept that and realize that at some point things aren't going to be as good as they are right now, then it puts more of the sense of urgency on what you do today to take advantage of those things because tomorrow may not be as good. And that's just a, a cautionary tale. But at the same time, I think if you're sitting there working hard and saving 70% of your money and living like Gandhi or something to try to, you know, amass this big stockpile of money, um, the money doing it that way doesn't make sense to me. Deploy the capital in something that pays you to own something and you'll never have to work ever again because the dividends you're getting from it will pay for your very existence and give you freedom back. Brilliant. I love it. Miles, super interesting conversation. If people want to listen to your podcast, if they want to get a hold of you, if they want to find out more about what you do, where can we send them? Well, uh, everything about me is at a website and it's called beunconstrained.com. And I live an unconstrained lifestyle. I don't you know, and, and the people who have gravitated towards that have similar ideals and goals to want to do the same thing. Uh, I do a podcast every week called The Unconstrained Podcast, in which I wax philosophically and talk about these challenges and different 
interesting ways, hacks, life hacks about how to do it. And uh, I have a course coming out on rental real estate, which is my um, amassing of 25 years of history going around the block as I have, what I learned from it and how somebody can use it as a kind of a masterclass into doing something similar and get their own freedom back from it as well. So all of that stuff is available at theunconstrained.com. Brilliant. I love it. Thank you so much, Miles. And I will talk to you soon. Thank you.